The oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear. And the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown. The year is 1932. Sat in a dimly lit office, Evelyn Dyer, a professor at the Miskatonic University in Arkham, reads over her papers and journals, muttering to herself, reminiscing over an old expedition, writing in her journal, speaking aloud as she does so. I am forced into speech because men of science have refused to follow my advice without knowing why. It is altogether against my will that I tell my reasons for opposing this contemplated invasion of Antarctica. With its vast fossil hunt and its wholesale boring and melting of the ancient ice cap. And I am more reluctant because my warning may be in vain. Doubt of the real facts, as I must reveal them, is inevitable. Yet... If I suppressed what will seem extravagant and incredible, there would be nothing left. The hitherto withheld photographs, both ordinary and aerial, will count in my favour, for they are damnable vivid and graphic. Still, there will be doubted because of the great lengths to which clever fakery can be carried. The ink drawings, of course, will be jeered at as obvious impostures notwithstanding a strangeness of technique which art experts ought to remark and puzzle over. The clock in her room ticks and tocks all the way through. The candles and lamps light her office, grace the journal to which she is writing on with intent. She takes a breath, an annoyed and almost defeated look upon her face, as she continues to write. In the end... I must rely on the judgment and the standing of the few scientific leaders who have, on the other hand, sufficient independence of thought to weigh my data on its own hideously convincing merits, or in the light of certain primordial and highly baffling myth cycles, and to the contrary, sufficient influence to deter the exploring world in general from any rash and overambitious program in the region of those mountains of madness. It is an unfortunate fact that relatively obscure people like myself and my associates, connected only with a small university, have little chance of making an impression when matters of a widely bizarre, controversial nature are concerned. It is further against us that we are not, in the strictest sense, specialists in the fields which came primarily to be concerned. As a geologist, my object in leading the Miskatonic University expedition was wholly that of securing deep level specimens of rock and soil from various parts of the Antarctic continent. Aided by the remarkable drill devised by Professor Frank H. Pabodi of our engineering department. The Professor Frank H. Pavodi stands now in front of Evelyn and the expedition crew, running through an explanation of the drill. Good morning, everyone. Now, before we set off the Arcadia, I thought I'd give you a rundown of this drill, just in case I'm not around to run it. If I'm injured or simply not present, you lot need to understand how to run it. This drill is unique and radical in its likeness. 
portability and capacity to combine the ordinary artisan drill principle with the principle of the small circular rock drill in such a way to cope quickly with strata of varying hardiness. It is still head, jointed tods, gasoline, motor collapsible, wood and derrick, dynamite and paraphernalia, cording, rubber removal auger and sectional piping for bores five inches wide and up to a thousand feet deep, all formed with the necessary accessories. No greater load than three seven dog sleds could carry. I had no wish to be a pioneer in any other field than this, but I did hope that the use of this new mechanical appliance at different points along previously explored paths would bring to light materials of a sort hitherto unreached by the ordinary methods of collection. I watched him explain his drill to my team of expeditioners, some looking enthralled, the younger students looking rather dulled out, by Frank's very in-depth explanation. As a team, we had managed to gather four large Dornier aeroplanes, designed especially for tremendous altitude flying necessary on the Antarctic Plateau, and with added fuel warming and quick starting devices, worked out by Frank, could transport our entire expedition from base at the edge of the Great Ice Barrier to various suitable inland points. We plan to cover as great an area as one Antarctic season or longer, if necessary. I remember Frank approaching me after his talk, saying, Evelyn, so great to see that I did not completely bore you to death with my talks about the drill. <laughs> yes, very funny, Frank, but no, it was very interesting. A good information for us as a team, even if some of the students looked bored. I thought it was interesting. You think so? Well, glad to hear it. Say, hey, word is spreading fast around Arkham about the expedition, even reaching as far as Boston from where, I, from where we're heading from. That is what journalists do, listening to headline stories, get them published and get the people talking, get them intrigued. I knew this plan could not stay a secret for long. The public knows of the Miskatonic expedition through our frequent wireless reports to the Arkham Advertiser and Associated Press, and through later articles I'm sure you and I will publish soon. Well, if this deal does its job and we find the stuff, then most certainly I will be writing about this expedition. Frank never failed to make me smile. The expedition consisted of four of us from the university. Frank, Lake of the biology department, Atwood of the physics department, also a meteorologist, and I representing geology and having nominal command. Besides 16 assistants, seven graduate students from Miskatonic and nine skilled mechanics. Of these 16, 12 were qualified aeroplane pilots, all but two of whom were competent wireless operators. Eight of them understood navigation with compass and sextant, as did Frank, Atwood and I. In addition, of course, our two ships, wooden ex-whalers, reinforced for ice conditioning and having auxiliary steam, were fully manned. It was all great publicity for those journalists. At Boston Harbour, the expedition had begun on September 2nd, 1930, taking various stops at a leisurely course. At the helm, J.B. Douglas navigated his ship, the Arkham, alongside George Toffinson, commanding the bark known as the Miskatonic. I distinctly remember leaving the inhabited world behind as the sun sank lower and lower in the north and stayed longer and longer above the horizon each day. We had spotted our first icebergs, table-like objects with vertical slides, and just before reaching the Antarctic Circle, which we crossed on October 20th with appropriately quaint ceremonies, we were considerably troubled with field ice. The falling temperatures bothered me considerably after our long voyage through the tropics. Looking out to the ice fields, I remember on many occasions the curious atmospheric effects enchanted me vastly. These included a strikingly vivid mirage, the first I had ever seen, on which distant bergs became battlements of unimaginable cosmic castles. Lake approached me at this point. As Evelyn's mind ran with imagination of icy battlefields, a tall English gentleman approached Evelyn, overlooking the Arctic Sea. 
He leant against the railing of the vessel, overlooking the icebergs. Stunning, isn't it? Incredibly so. Despite the vicious cold, I could spend a long time up here, observing the formations of ice, the way it poses itself in the sea. <laughs> well, don't go getting frozen on the railing or making yourself unwell. I need my commanding lady. Even if some of the team believe that I should be leading, but I leave myself in your very capable hands, Miss Dyer. Charming as ever, Lake. On the morning of October 26, a strong land blink appeared on the south, and before noon, we all felt a thrill of excitement at beholding a vast, lofty, and snow-clad mountain chain, which opened up and covered the whole vista ahead. At last, we had encountered an outpost of the great unknown continent and its cryptic world of frozen death. The last lap of our voyage was vivid and fancy-stirring, great barren peaks of mystery looming up constantly against the west as the low northern sun of noon, or the still lower horizon grazing southern sun of midnight, poured its hazy reddish rays over the white snow, bluish ice and water lanes, and black bits of exposed granite slope. Through the desolate summits swept raging and intermittent gusts of the terrible Antarctic wind, whose cadences sometimes held vague suggestions of a wild and half-sentient musical piping, with notes extending over a wide range, and which for some subconscious mnemonic reason seemed to me disquieting and even dimly terrible. Something about the scene reminded me of the strange and disturbing uh, Asian painting of Nicholas Rorich, and of still stranger and more disturbing descriptions of the evilly fabled Plateau of Leng, which occur in the dreaded Necronomicon of Abdul al -Hazurid. I was rather sorry later that I had ever investigated that monstrous book in the college library. Pushing further on, on my next entry on the 17th of November, sight of the westward range having been temporarily lost, we began giving places names for our own, for memory and places to look at if we got lost, like Franklin Island, Mount Erebus and Terror, and the Parry Mountains. The Scoriac Peak towered up some 12,700 feet against the eastern sky, like a Japanese print of the sacred Fujiyama, while beyond it rose the white ghost-like height of Mount Terror, 10,900 feet in altitude, and now extinct as a volcano. Danny, one of the brilliant young students, pointed out to me. Miss Dyer, look over there. It looks like lava on the snowy slope. It's remarking the mountain. Danny Forth, a graduate student of the Miskatonic University. Small, pretty, brown hair and green eyes, all covered up with protective snow gear. My goodness, you are correct. That mountain was discovered in 1840. Good spotting, Danny. Thank you, Miss Dyer. You know, it reminds me of some of the books I read in the library. It reminds me of Edgar Allan Poe. He wrote stories, possibly inspired by this site. Danny was a great reader of bizarre material and had talked a good deal of Poe. I was interested myself because of the Antarctic scene of Poe's only story, the disturbing, enigmatical Arthur Gordon Pym. Not too far from here, closer to the shore next to the dubbed Ross Island, we set up our first camp. Most of our items still aboard the Arkham. The team had started gathering our items, dog sleds, aeroplane parts, cameras, both ordinary and aerial, we hoped to complete our work during a single Antarctic summer, but if this proved impossible, we would winter on the Arkham, sending the Miskatonic North before the freezing of the ice for another summer's supplies. I need not repeat what the newspapers have already published about our early work, of our ascent of Mount Erebus, our successful mineral borings at several points on Ross Island, and the singular speed which Frank's apparatus accomplished them. Our good luck and efficiency had been indeed almost... Uncanny. The team completed many earlier tasks. Frank's drill was a complete success. With the assistance of 16 students and 9 mechanics, the construction of Dornier airplanes was successful as well, at further outpost bases in the frozen wasteland. Dyer, Bobobi, Outward Fourth. <laughs> I have been planning on taking a small team, or if not, myself, northwestward. 
Sir, that's not on our original trip plans. I believe we were meant to be staying on this side. Ah, she's right, Lake. What are you planning? Uh, I have been thinking. Pondering a, a great deal. And it's given me some radical thoughts to explore regions that no man has ever trod before. A chance to be the first. I shall return soon, hopefully, with some findings. Possibly some more minerals. Especially if no one has ever walked in that triangular slate before. Please be careful, Lake. We don't want to lose a team member after doing so well. That is an order. Yes, ma'am. But I know there is something out there. I shall return soon. Keep those files warm for me. No, no, you're, you're not going alone. I'll bring the drill. I admit, uh, his curiosity has me intrigued. In time, they did return. He found fragments of the triangle slate returning with markings. He was strangely convinced that the marking on the slate was the print of some considerably advanced evolution, notwithstanding that the rock which bore it was a so vastly ancient date Cambrian, if not actually pre-Cambrian, as to preclude the probable existence of not only of all highly evolved life, but of any life at all above the unicellular or at most trilobite stage. These fragments with their odd marking must have been 5,000 million to 1,000 million years old. This is what we have been wanting to discover, Evelyn. Look at this, and from what you're saying, it is ancient, mythic even, a grand discovery. We need to wire this to the university, get, get the public talking, that our expedition is beginning to look even more promising. Perhaps we can take some of the sleds with us, take the drill further northwestward into the more regions not touched by man. Or penetrated by human imagination. I remember looking at Frank. We did not mention his wild hopes of revolutionising the entire sciences of biology and geology. We simply kept quiet. The man had become obsessed. His preliminary sledging and boring journey of January 11th to 18th with Frank and five others, marred by the loss of two dogs in an upset when crossing one of the great pressure ridges in the ice, had brought up more and more of the Archean slate. And even I was interested by the singular profusion of evident fossil markings in that unbelievably ancient stratum. These markings, however, were of very primitive life forms involving no great paradox except that any life forms should occur in rock as definitely pre Cambrian as they seem to be. Hence, I still fail to see the good sense of Lake's demand for an interlude in our time saving programme. An interlude requiring the use of all four planes, many men, and the whole of the expedition's mechanical apparatus. I did not, in the end, veto the plan, though I decided not to accompany the Northwestward party, despite Lake's pleas. Evelyn, please. This is the brink of something. I know it is. I can feel it. Please, join us. I need your skills. You're a master of geology, and I need the knowledge to help me with these fossils. Lake, I have not vetoed your plan, but I refuse to participate. This wild exhibition of yours is already costing us time. But if you are certain about this, I will not stop you. I will remain at the home base with the others and plan the original eastward directions and path we will take with Frank and Danny. I'll keep in contact with our team. I'll take the first on the airplane, build with my team, and head off northwest in the morning. Just promise me you'll be okay here. I should be asking you to do the same. Lake gave Evelyn a smile, unsure if both were to see each other again. The journey was perilous, to venture into territory unknown by mankind, never tread on by a human footstep. Evelyn returned to her camp with Frank, Danny and the other members of the team, as Lake with his team headed northwestward on January 22nd, 300 miles away from the original base camp. Six hours after they left, a very excited message we received came told of the frantic, beaver-like work whereby a shallow shaft had been sunk and blasted culminating in the discovery of slate fragments with several markings approximately like the one which caused the original puzzlement. Another two hours later, Lake sent another message. I found new specimens and these 
specimens have made any hazard worth taking. I would not lie to you, Evelyn. I think the man is going a little, well, <laughs> overboard with this whole fossil thing. Uh, it is really stopping the original expedition, don't you think? I agree. His excitement is reaching the point of mutiny. I remember looking at Frank's face, both silently agreeing that we could do nothing to check this headlong risk of the whole expedition's success. But it was appalling to think of his plunging deeper and deeper into that treacherous and sinister white immensity of tempests and unfathomed mysteries which stretch off for some 15,500 miles to the half-known, half-suspected coast loon of Queen Mary and Knox Lands. Then, in about an hour and a half more, came that doubly exciting messages from Lake's moving plane which almost reversed my sentiments and had me wish I had accompanied the party. 10.05pm on the wing, after snowstorm, have spied mountain range ahead higher than any hitherto seen. Meiko Himalaya is allowing for the height of plateau, portable at 276 degrees 15 inches, longitude 113 degrees 10 east, reaches as far as one can see to the right and left. Suspicion of two smoking cones, all peaks black and bare of snow, gale blowing off of them impedes the navigation. My god! Team, gather round. Lake's found something. After that, Frank, the team and I hung breathlessly over the receiver. Thought of this titanic mountain rampart 700 miles away inflamed our deepest sense of adventure. And we rejoiced that our expedition, if not ourselves personally, had been its discoverers. In half an hour, Lake called us again. Plane falls down on plateau and foothills, but nobody hurt and perhaps can repair. Shall transfer essentials to other free for return or further moves, if necessary, but no more heavy plane travel needed just for now. Mountain surpasses anything in imagination. I'm going scouting, Carol's playing with all the weight out. You can't imagine anything like this. Highest peaks must go over 35,000 feet. Everest is out of the running. That would work out the height in the theatre light, whilst Carol and I go up. Probably Precambian slate with strata mixed in. Old skyline effects. Regular sections of cues clinging to the highest peaks. Whole thing marvellous in this red gold light of the low sun. Like a land of mystery and a dream or a gateway to a forbidden world of untrodden wonder. Wish you were here to study. Evelyn, Frank, this is extraordinary. Perhaps we were wrong to judge Lake and his obsession. It's clear he's found something worthy of the whole expedition. I'll be the first to say I am wrong. The man may have bridged on to mutiny, but he has found something we might as well travel to. But the question is how? We can devise a plan in the morning, but I do not want to rest just yet in case he sends another message. Carol in highest foothills, don't dare try little peaks in current weather, but sure later. Free for work climbing, and hard going in its altitude, but worth it. Grip range very solid, hence can't get any glimpses beyond. Main summits exceed Himalayas and are very unusual. Range looks like pre Cambrian slant with uh, plain signs of other upheaved strata. What's wrong about volcanism? goes farther in either direction than we can see. It's so clear as snow to an above 21,000 feet. Odd formations on the slopes of highest mountains. Great low square blocks of exactly vertical sides and rectangular lines of vertical ramparts. Uh, like the old Asian castles clinging from the steep mountains in Rogue's paintings. <laughs> Impressive, from a distance. Uh, a few close close to some, and uh, Carol thought they may be formed of separate pieces, uh, but this is probably weathering. Uh, most edges crumbled and rounded off as if exposed to storms and climate changes for millions of years. Parts, uh, especially the upper parts, seem to be of a lighter coloured rock than any of the visible strata on the slopes, hence an evidently crystalline origin. 
closer flying, shows many cave mouths and some unusually regular in outline, square or semicircular. You have to come and investigate. I think I saw a rampart on one of the uh, on the top of one peak. Height seems to be about 30,000 to 35,000 feet. I am 21,500 feet myself, and devilish gnawing cold. Uh, wind whistles and pipes through the passes in and out of the caves, but there's no flying danger so far. With the Miskatonic expedition team becoming more and more excited by the idea of discovering a mountain range with structures and enormous entrances, that makes the known mountains like the Himalayas seem small in comparison. Plans of transporting the eastward team to Lake's northwestward encampment were put into motion. Evelyn, taking the role of the natural team leader, to which many to her surprise followed her lead. A plane was to be sent back to their location, but in the meantime, Lake continuously sent Evelyn and the team messages regarding discoveries found at these mountains. Lisa, examining certain skeletal fragments of a large land and marine sore and primitive mammals, I found a singular local wound or injuries to a bony structure, not attributable to any known predatory or carnivorous animal of any period. Of two sorts, straight penetrative bores, and apparently a hacking incision, one or two cases of clearly severed bone, not many specimens affected. I am sending to camp for electronic torches, will extend search area underground by hacking away at stalactites. Ten fifteen PM important discovery. Two crews are working underground at nine forty five of light found a monstrous barrel shaped fossil of wholly unknown nature, probably vegetable, uh, unless overgrown specimen of unknown marine radiator. Tissue evidently preserved by mineral salts, tough as leather, but astonishingly flexibility retained in places. Marks of broken off parts at ends and around sides. Uh, six feet end to end, 3.5 central diameter, tapering to one foot at each end. Remain arrangements remind one of certain monsters uh, of primal myth, especially elder things in the in Necronomicon. Can't decide a vegetable or animal. Must wait. Having trouble with fox, they can't endure uh, with the new specimen and would probably tear it to pieces. Organic specimens. Dark grey. Four grade specimens. Cthulhu cult appendages. Congrats Frank on the drill that opened the cave. Now will Arkham please repeat the description? The sensations of Frank and myself at receipt of this report were almost beyond description. Not were our companions much behind us in enthusiasm. I sent late congratulations as soon as the Arkham's operator had repeated back the descriptive parts as requested. I added some remarks to be relayed through the Arkham to the outside world. Of course, rest was an absurd thought to miss this excitement and my only wish was to get to Lake's camp as quickly as I could. It disappointed me when he sent word that... A rising mountain gale making aerial travel impossible. But within an hour and a half, interest again rose to banish disappointment. Lake was sending more messages and told of the completely successful transportation of the four great specimen to the camp. Lake was making crude attempts at a dissection. I'm puzzled even where to begin with initial incisions, without causing any kind of violence to the creature's body, and not upset with the structural niceties I'm looking for. The creature has remnants of a starfish arrangement at both ends, and has been badly crushed, and only partially disrupted along one of the great torso furrows. 
results quickly reported over the wireless were baffling and provocative indeed. Nothing like delicacy or accuracy was possible with instruments hardly able to cut the anomalous tissue. But the little that was achieved left us all awed and bewildered. Existing biology would have to be wholly revised for this thing was no product of any cell growth science knows about. There had been scarcely any mineral placement, and despite an age of perhaps 40 million years, the internal organs were wholly intact. The leathery, undeteriorative, and almost indestructible quality was an inherent attribute of the thing's form or organisation, and pertained to some paleogene cycle of invertebrate evolution utterly beyond our powers of speculation. At first, all that Lake found was dry. But as the heated tent produced its thawing effect, organic moisture of pungent and offensive odour was encountered toward the thing's uninjured side. It was not blood, but a thick, dark green fluid apparently answering the same purpose. Clearly it was amphibian, and probably adapted to a long airless hibernation periods as well. Lake whimsically recalls the primal myths about great old ones who filtered down from the stars and concocted earth life as a joke or mistake, and the wild tales of cosmic hill things from outside told by a folklorist colleague in Miskatonic's English department. Lake fell back on mythology for a provisional name, jocosely dubbing his finds the Elder Ones. It was after four when Lake at last prepared to sign off and advise us all to share the rest period. The winds did howl that night, on and on, all communication from Lake severed from the gale winds that blasted the tents, the crew resting in the ice caps of Antarctica. None of us, I imagined, slept very heavily or continuously that morning, for both the excitement of Lake's discovery and the mounting fury of the wind were against such a thing. So savage were the blasts even where we were that we could not help wondering how much worse it was at Lake's camp, directly under the vast unknown peaks that bred and delivered it. Anyone get any sleep at all? Barely any. You, Evelyn? I did not sleep much either, much like young Danny. I was excited, but mainly cautious of the windstorm. Are any others awake? I... but I was awake at 10am, uh, I believe. Said he was trying to get on to get Lake on the wireless, as we had agreed last night, but some electrical condition in the, uh, there was some form of uh, electrical condition in the disturbed air to the westward seemed to prevent some, our uh, like, uh, communications. I remember looking at Frank's unfazed expressions as he told me this information as I exited my tent. Danny too seemed unfazed, but I began to feel an unsettling anxiety in my stomach. We did, however, get the Arkham, and Douglas told me that he had likewise been vainly trying to reach Lake. He had not known about the wind, for very little was blowing at his sound station. McMurdo Sound, despite its persistent rage where we were. Throughout the day we all listened anxiously, and tried to get Lake at intervals, but invariably without results. About noon, a positive frenzy of wind stampede out of the west, causing us to fear the safety of our camp but it eventually died down, with only a moderate relapse at 2pm. After 3 o'clock it was very quiet, we doubled our efforts to get Lake. I've heard nothing from Lake. Anyone else? Mutai and I have heard of nothing either, and we begin to suspect something is wrong. He has had four planes, each provided with an excellent shortwave outfit. I cannot imagine any ordinary accident capable of crippling all his wireless equipment at the same time. Nor could I. Perhaps the drill exploded? No, they said it was in perfect condition over the wireless, and you yourself said it was extremely reliable. I must agree with Danny. The drill cannot be the reason, something else. What are you suggesting, Evelyn? I cannot be sure. I truly can't. I hope they're okay. By six o'clock, our fears had become intense and definite, and after a wireless consultation with Douglas and Thornfinison, I resolved to take steps towards investigation. We left the fifth aeroplane at McMurdo Sound Supply Cache. It is in good shape and ready for instant use, according to Douglas and the sailors. 
Seems like we'll be using it for the emergency use, which it had been saved for. I'll wireless to Sherman and order him to join us with the plane, and the two sailors he is with at the southern base ASAP. The air conditions seem to be extremely favourable. For now. With a daughter like that, it would be enough to hold all of us. The dogs and the sleds too. Hence why I had them especially acquired for this expedition, which seems to be going horribly wrong. At intervals, I still try to reach Lake with the wireless, but all to no purpose. George Larson and the other sailors took off at 7.30 and reported a quiet flight upon several points in the wing. They arrived at our base at midnight. At 7.15am, January 25th, we started flying northwestward under McTeach pilotage with 10 men, 7 dogs, a sledge, fuel and food supply and other items including the plane's wireless outfit. Atmosphere seems quiet today. No wind, no snow. Relatively milder in temperature than last night. I don't think we'll have any trouble on this flight. I should hope so, Frank. I have tried a few times on the wireless, but only silence answers my calls to Lake's camp. We need to work as a team here. Who knows what will be out there? Every instant of that four and a half hour flight is burned into my recollection because of its crucial position. It marked my loss at the age of 34 of all that peace and balance which the normal mind possessed through its accustomed conception of external nature and nature's laws. Henceforward, the ten of us, but the student Danny and myself above all, were to face a hideously amplified world of lurking horrors which nothing can erase from our emotions, and which we would refrain from sharing with mankind in general if we could. There came a point, though, when our sensations could not be conveyed in any words the press would understand, and a later point when we had to adopt an actual rule of strict censorship. The sailor, Larson, was first to spy the jagged line of witch-like cones and pinnacles ahead, and a shout sent everyone to the windows of the great cabin plane. They seem far away, which means uh, we are too. Leg did not lie. The summits are massive, bleak and black. Do you see that fantastical reddish light against the background of the summits? In the whole spectacle there was a persistent, pervasive hint of stupendous secrecy and potential revelation. As of these stark night, a spire's marked the pylons of a frightful gateway into forbidden spheres of dream and complex gulfs of remote time, space and ultra-dimensionality. I could not help feeling that they were evil things. Mountains of madness, whose farther slopes looked out over some accursed ultimate abyss. That seething, half-luminous cloud background held ineffable suggestions of a vague, ethereal beyondness, far more than terrestrial special, and gave appalling reminders of the utter remoteness, separateness, desolation, and eon-long death of this untrodden, unfathomed astral world. Breaking my silence, Danny spoke to us. Nothing something of importance. Look, up in the skyline above the mountains. Do you see them? Perfect fragmented cubes. Lake mentioned those in his messages. Aye, look at them. They do look like temples, don't they? Weird cubes floating in the air and that. At the moment, I felt sorry that I had ever read the appalled Necronomicon. I had seen dozens of polar mirages during the preceding weeks some of them quite uncanny and fantastically vivid as the present sample. But this one had a wholly novel and obscure quality of menacing symbolism, and I shuddered as the seething labyrinth of fabulous walls and towers and minarets loomed out of the troubled ice vapours above our head. Finally we made our descent. Some hours after our landing, we sent a guarded report of the tragedy we found. Oh shit! That's just swell. The drill's broken. I don't know if I can fucking fix it. Hey, what gives? Where is everybody? Hurrying from the tent, Evan runs out into the cold and proceeds to be sick. You don't want to go in there. Why? What is it? What happened? You don't want to go in there. Jesus! Wept! It was not as Lake had left it. On and around the laboratory table in the tent were strewn other things, and it did not take long for her to guess that those were the carefully, though oddly inexpertly, dissected parts of one man, one dog. 
I shall spare the feelings of the survivors by omitting mention of the man's identity. Anatomical instruments are missing. Gasoline stove has gone. Books, writing materials. What in the same hell is going on here? I think we've seen enough. Where is the rest of the team? We searched the other tents. Professor Dyer, Frank, come quickly. We found the others. The crowning abnormality, of course, was the condition of the bodies. Men and dogs alike. They had all been in some terrible kind of conflict and were torn and mangled fiendish and altogether inexplicable ways. What the hell did this? Wind must have driven them insane. They did this to each other? It is clear that there was some kind of conflict here. The wounds inflicted are the same on the dogs as the men. There are signs of strangulation and laceration. The trouble must have started with the dogs. That's right, we all heard how crazy they went. Maybe the same thing that drove the dogs wild, drove the men wild too. Two-legged or four-legged, the fatter, healthier bodies have had their most solid masses of tissues removed with considerable precision, and around each victim, a strange sprinkling of salt, presumably taken from the provision chest. I count eleven bodies. Someone's missing. Gedney. Son of a bitch. Gedney? The assistant? He did this? I don't see any other possible explanation. Do you? A short distance from the camp, the specimens, of course, had been covered with a tent cloth, yet the low Antarctic sun had beat steadily upon that cloth, and Lake had mentioned that the solar heat tended to make the strangely sound, tough tissues of the thing relax and expand. Perhaps the wind had whipped the cloth from over them and jostled them about in such a way that their more pungent olfactory qualities became manifest despite their unbelievable antiquity. Didn't Lake say they found 14 specimens? There's only six... Eight are missing. Those things, Lake said it himself, they were... They were dead. Gedney did this. He overwhelmed eleven men. His mind snapped, Evelyn. He was insane. Ever tried to restrain a madman? Must have taken one of those and the sledges and one of the specimens with him. Now hang on. He can't have got far. Sherman McTighe. Mutai, you're with me. Yes, sir. The search for Gedney would be to no avail. After our day of terror and bafflement, we buried the dead and retired to a temporary camp. How do we tell the world about this? We don't. But these men and women have families. We've got to tell them something. All they need to know is Mother Nature wrought her worst and all were lost. And Gedney? Unless we're able to hold into account, the same applies to him. He also had family. It ain't right. No. It certainly is not. Well, the drill's fucking kaput. Nothing I can salvage. I suggest we pack up and head back tomorrow. Agreed. But before we do, I would like to take just one last look at those mountains. And why would you want to fucking do that? Evelyn, what the hell for? For Lake and the others. For the long age pursuit of the unknown. January 26th, 7am. Danny and Evelyn set off for their aerial journey in a lighter-equipped Dornier. How high do you make it? We're already 12,000 feet up. The lowest available pass to get us over that ridge is... 23... 24,000 feet. We're gonna have to travel light. Maybe half a full tank? Well, what are we waiting for? It was the mountainside tangle of irregular cave mouths which fascinated and disturbed us most. A few more feet of altitude and we would behold the realm. Danny and I, unable to speak except in shouts amidst the howling, piping wind that raced through the pass and added to the noise of the unmuffled engines. Even the wind's burden held a particular strain of conscious malignity. Up, Danny, up! Do you hear that whistling? Hold on tight. And then, having gained those last few feet, we did indeed stare across the momentous divide and over the unsampled secrets of an elder and utterly alien earth. 
think that both of us simultaneously cried out in mixed awe, wonder, terror and disbelief in our own senses as we finally cleared the pass and saw what lay beyond. Dear Lord. But how? What kind of people would have lived in a place like this, Professor? We should find somewhere to land and take a closer look. There's a spot. I thought again of the eldritch primal myths that had so persistently haunted me since my first sight of this dead Antarctic world. Of the Migo. Of the Cthulhu cult. Of the Necronomicon. The air is quite thin. No sense in carrying too much equipment. Take only essentials. Do you have a compass? Ropes? Torches? Camera? I have a hammer and chisel, and some specimen bags. Oh, and extra paper we could tear up if we need to leave a trail. Ah, the ancient principle of hare and hounds. Good thinking. Okay, let's go. Walking cautiously downhill over the crusted snow towards the stupendous stone labyrinth that loomed against the opalescent west. We felt almost a keener sense of imminent marvels as we had felt on approaching the unfathomed mountain pass. It only took us a few steps to bring us to a shapeless, ruin-worn level with the snow. Magnificent. It looks to be made of Jurassic sandstone. Look at the walls inside. Many of the buildings in the city proper are less ice-choked. We shouldn't have too much trouble finding a way down to ground level. Down the rabbit hole we go. Just how extensive a territory we had opened, it was impossible to guess without a trail. Imagination could conceive almost anything in connection with this place. That's more like it. Tread carefully, Danny. <laughs> there. It wasn't so bad. Pity we couldn't bring Frank with us. He might have helped us guess how such titanic blocks could have been handled when this city was built. What was that? Hmm? Thought I heard something. That whistling. What was it Frank said? The howling of demons. What if- Put yourself together, Danny. You have your camera? Yes. Let me get it. Huh? What is it, Danny? I thought I saw... something. I haven't seen anything older than the Pliocene Age yet, which would make this place 500,000 years old. Probably older. Nothing could possibly still be living here. You're jumping at windows and shadows. But what happened back at Lake's Camp? There don't appear to be any strong currents. Perhaps now would be a convenient point to start that trail of yours. This way, Danny. They pushed deeper and deeper into the snowstruck city. Finally, they encountered the entrance they had wished for, an archway about six feet wide and ten feet high. It was totally dark inside, and the archway seemed to open on a well of illimitable emptiness. Curious. Petrified material, original wood. The grain is still discernible. These shutters were closed before the glacial sheet formed. Uh, perhaps the coming of the ice had been foreseen. Allowing some nameless population to leave en masse. These murals. Vivid, skillfully intricate, and yet utterly alien. Professor, the floor. It's a map. Now we have the big picture. These are just many parts of a greater whole. The history of this aeon dead civilization. Ask now how or why we here have the answer to where, when, and what. Each chamber is a period in this world's glorious past. The maps and astrological charts provide a context to the events depicted on the walls. Come along, Danny. We have much to learn. Look, the tale told here is now pre-terrestrial history. How so? The map beneath your feet is now longer of any earthly geographical formation. The constellation above your head differs to that of any seen in our heavens. The things which once lived here, they were not brainless dinosaurs, they were wise and ancient, filtered down from the stars when the earth was young. Beings whose substance and alien evolution had shaped, and whose power was such a thing as this planet had never bred, and this, and this, this, this must be an educational centre of some sort. A school? A university. It tells of the coming of these old ones to this earth. Their coming, and the coming of many other alien entities. Here, let me read. They traverse the interstellar ether on their vast, membranous wings. They lived under the sea, built fantastic cities. It was there that they first created Earth life. Multicellular protoplasma vicious masses. Ideal slaves without doubt what Abdulhazred called Shoggoths in his frightful Necronomicon. 
So, what that man wrote was all true? With the aid of Shoggoths, cities under the sea grew to vast labyrinths of stone, not unlike this one. Wherever they lived, mountain peaks or the ocean's deepest depths, these beings were highly adaptable. Very few seemed to die at all, except by violence. At long last, I see a familiar form. We were nothing more than occasional meal and amusement. Humans? We... were a joke? A mistake? What? A byproduct of unguided evolution. Dear God. The old ones survived the continental drift. However, the upheaval of new land in the South Pacific had tremendous implications. This creature here, Great Cthulhu. Here, another script. We participated a war which drove the old ones back to the sea. They would later establish peace. But then the lands of the Pacific sank again, taking with them the fabled city of Relaya. The old ones would once again reign supreme. With the march of time, however, the Shugoths, the, the slaves of the Old Ones, beginning to acquire a dangerous degree of accidental intelligence. They were growing steadily interdependent, displaying occasional stubborn outbursts. So, I guess they rose up against their masters? Indeed they did. With terrible consequences. During the Jurassic Age, the Old Ones met fresh adversity in the form of half-fungus, half-crustacean creatures. The Necronomicon refers to them as Maigo, or the Abominable Snowman. <laughs> Doesn't sound like any Abominable Snowman I've ever heard of. But they did reside in the Himalayas. The Old Ones tried to fight the Maigo in space, but found the secrets of interstellar travel lost to them. Eventually, the Maigo drove the Old Ones back to the sea. Little by little, the slow retreat of the Elder Race to their original Antarctic habitat was beginning. It seems there was one part of the ancient land which had come to be shunned as evil, but the cities built on it crumbled before their time and were deserted. Then a frightful line of the Earth's loftiest peaks suddenly shot up amidst the most appalling din and chaos. Roughly 300 miles west from here. The Old Ones would pray to those mountains, but none ever went near them. They were afraid of them? Which would give us good reason to be afraid of them too. Nor is it to be though that man is either the oldest or the last of Earth's masters. The old ones were, the old ones are, and the old ones shall be. The wind gibbers with their voices, and the earth mutters with their consciousness. Kadath in the cold waste hath known them, and what man knows of Kadath? The ice desert of the south, and the sunken isles of the ocean hold stones whereon their seal is engraved. As a foulness you shall ye know then. They wait patient and potent, and here shall they reign again. Perhaps I'm not now sceptical about old tales and fears I used to be. There may be a very real and very monstrous meaning in that old about Kadath and the colder waste. And the city was hardly less strange. Soon after it was founded, the great mountain range became the seat of principal temples. Those curiously clinging cubes. Exactly. Here, at another tome, they explored deep underground where limestone veins had been hollowed out by groundwaters and discovered a great sunless sea. Little did they know these groundwaters had trickled down from that horrible mountain in the west. That great abyss is where the inhabitants of the city retreated to in the face of an advancing ice age. I, I suppose this brings about a change in our immediate objective. We'll never find it. Not in this maze. Don't forget, we know the where, and judging by this map, not more than a quarter mile from here. We must be close. We don't have enough batteries to let our torches burn forever. Wait, can you smell that? What? Gasoline. Damn it. He must have made it here by foot. He had at least a day's lead on us. Who? Gedney! Danny, wait! The whistling. You hear it? Danny, for God's sake, wait! What greeted young Danny was the bodies of young Gedney and the missing dog. Frozen. Danny? Those things, Professor. The things Lake found. They weren't dead, were they? They were only sleeping. 
Danny, wait for me! What we heard was not the fabulous, not of any buried blasphemy-eyed Elder Earth. It was simply the raucous squawking of a penguin. Suddenly, a bulky white shape loomed up ahead of us, and we flashed on the second torch. It was only a penguin. A bite of a huge and unknown species, larger than the greatest of the known king penguins, and monstrous in its albinism and virtual eyelessness. Careful now. Their eyes! Where are their eyes? What need have they for eyes in the perpetual darkness of a sunless sea? Where do you think it's going? Let's find out, shall we? So long as we don't make too much noise, we shouldn't get any trouble from our sightless friend. We wondered, too, what had caused these penguins to venture out of their usual domain. The state and silence of the great dead city made it clear that it had at no time been a habitual seasonal rookery. You feel that? Warm air! The incline here is getting gradually steeper. My- ah! Professor! Are you alright? I'm fine! Oh, a little bruise, nothing broken. What is this? Looks like more of that tent covering from the camp. It came this way. Professor, look! The markings on the walls. They're different. My god, what the hell is that? We saw certain obstructions on the polished floor ahead. Obstructions which were quite definitely not penguins. They resembled star-mounted graves that housed the specimens at Lake's camp. However, there was only four of them, not six. Oh, that smell. It's their blood. Poor devils. Devils is about right. Don't you see, Danny? They were beings of another age, beings of science, just like us. But what they did to camp, to Lake and the others. But indeed, what have they done? They woke up in the cold of an unknown epoch, greeted by barking quadrupeds and equally frantic simians with odd wrappings. They were scientists to the last. What have they done that we would not have done in their place? I say we leave. Now. Wait! <laughs> no dice. I'm out of here. I've seen enough and I've heard enough, thank you. Their heads, Danny. They've been torn off. Which is exactly why I'm not sticking around. Huh? There it is again. That noise. Ever since we got here. Only now. It sounds like a train. <laughs> Yes, Professor? Run. <laughs> it's gaining on us. We would see at last. A complete and living specimen of those animals. Again came that insidious musical piping. Don't look back! In here! Under candle. We threaded our way back through the dead city into the surface. In less than a quarter of an hour, we had found our way back to the ice choked terrace where we had landed some hours earlier. We paused to catch our breath and turn again at the fantastic tangle of incredible stone shape below us, once more outlined mystically against an unknown west. For a second, we gasped in admiration of the scene's unearthly cosmic beauty, and the vague horror began to creep into our souls. For this far violet line pinnacle against the western sky could be nothing but the dreaded cadaver from the cold waste. I can take it from here, Danny. You should rest. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. What is it, Danny? What the hell did you see? No one must know. We must never tell. We must never tell. For the peace and safety of mankind, no one must know. No one must know! No! 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 All that Danny has ever hinted at is that the final horror was a mirage. It was not, she declares, anything connected with the cubes and caves of echoing, vaporous, warmly honeycombed mountains of madness which we crossed. But a single fantastic demonic glimpse among the churning zenith clouds of what lay back of those other violet westward mountains which the old ones had shunned and feared.
We vowed to safeguard the public general peace of mind. On our return, Danny was close to hysterics, but kept an admirable stiff upper lip. We said nothing. More to the others than what we had agreed, and the samples we had gathered, our sketches and our camera films for private development later on. We laid our absence of 16 hours to a long spell of adverse weather conditions, and told truly of our landing on further foothills. Fortunately, our tale sounded realistic and prosaic enough not to tempt the others into emulating our flight. While we were gone, Frank, Sherman and McTeege had worked over Lake's two best planes, fitting them again for use. We reached our old base on the evening of the next day, after a swift non-stop flight. In five days more, the Arkham and Miskatonic were shaking clear of the thickening ice field, and a fortnight later, we left that last hint polar land behind us. Since our return, we have all constantly worked to discourage Antarctic exploration, and have kept the true story to ourselves with splendid unity and faithfulness. But young Danny, she is now known to be among the few who have ever dared to go completely through that warm, riddled copy of the Necronomicon. She still suffers.